Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for coming out here to the industry panel. We're really excited to have you, and I'm sure our panelists are ready and excited to answer some questions and some questions that you guys may have regarding um, any information you'd like, any insight you'd like on the industry. So we have a great amount of panelists today. Thank you guys so much for coming out and being here and for your time. So I'm going to introduce each one of them to you guys. Um, when I say your name, please raise your hand, wave to the audience so that they know where to spot you guys already. So we have Stan Berkowitz, a writer and producer. Stan has written and story edited and or produced over 400 TV episodes ranging from hard-boiled police stories to superhero tales featuring the likes of Batman, Superman, and Spider-Man. A couple of his credits include writing 48 episodes of Tales, sorry, of Superman, the animated series, and 44 episodes of Batman Beyond. He's a graduate of UCLA's Master of Fine Arts screenwriting program and is currently writing episodes of the animated 1001 Nights television series. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> All right, up next we have Michael Claridge a senior talent manager. He is an alumnus of Moore Park College and graduated in 2018 before transferring to CSUN where he earned his bachelor's degree in film producing. He began his career in the security department at Warner Bros Studios before transitioning to the film television casting department. Following his tenure at Warner Bros, he pursued a role as a talent manager for film and television actors. Presently, Michael serves as a senior talent manager at Studio 71, where he collaborates closely with some of YouTube's most prominent talent. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Alrighty, we also have Robert Florio, editor, director, and producer. He has worked in the television and motion picture industry for over 35 years and has five primetime Emmy nominations for editing, among many other producing, editing, and directing awards. Robert has edited 108 episodes of CBS's NCIS Los Angeles. Robert co-directed, produced, and wrote The Choice, a short film that won multiple awards in different fem film festivals. Robert also directed Spiritual Teachings by the Dalai Lama and co-directed an adoption of La Traviata, an opera for broadcast around the world. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> All right. We also have Darcy Florio, a director, producer, and voiceover actress and loop group coordinator. She is fluent in Spanish, is a member of SAG-AFTRA. Her voiceover artist, um, work contains over 500 hours of television. She also has experience in directing, including a six-minute short of Animal Style, The Choice, a 28-minute short, and the Golden State Film Festival Best Shorts Competition. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Up next, we have Bridget Fernando. <laughs> A talent acquisitions at NBC Universal. She is an alumna of Moore Park College and CSUN and worked on the Oscars campaign for Avengers Endgame with Weta Digital and Dig Disney Studios. She has worked the red carpet for the Television Critics Association, Visual Effects Society Awards, and Lumiere Awards. Currently, Bridget is at NBC Universal as a talent acquisition coordinator in Los Angeles. She supports the candidate's experience team, scheduling candidate and hiring manager interviews. Bridget received a GEM Award, Going the Extra Mile, the highest level award an NBCU employee can receive. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Up next, we have Rick Gurr from Warner Bros. He is originally from um, New York came to Southern California after graduating from the University of Richmond, Virginia in, seven, in 1973, a double major in speech and dramatic arts and education. After several years working in theater in San Diego and Chicago, he came up to Los Angeles where he ultimately moved into animation post-production. He has worked in animation since 1977 and such studios 
and studios such as Kurtz and Friends, Duck Soup Filmation, and Marvel, and is currently about to begin his 37th year at Warner Bros. in Burbank. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> and finally, we have Joanne Lowry, an assistant director. Joanne earned two bachelor's degrees at Virginia Tech and graduated from the prestigious Directors Guild of America trainee program. Joanne has been working for over 20 years as an assistant director in both television and film. Her recent works inc includes 911, Prey, Cocaine Bear, and The Lincoln Lawyer. Other credits include HBO's Deadwood and CBS's Criminal Minds Beyond Borders. She started out at ABC's The Drew Carey Show. Her hobbies include gardening, vintage trailer restoration, and hunting for bargains at thrift stores. Let's give all of our panelists a round of applause. <laughs> all right, thank you guys so much for being here again. We do have a couple of questions to begin and then we can open it up to the audience. Since we do have a lot of questions and we're fortunate enough to have all of you guys here, we are gonna give you guys about one to two minutes to answer each question. Once you are done, you can pass down the microphone. All right, so our first question, we'll start with you is please tell us about how you got your first and current job in the industry and what responsibilities they each entail. Well, how I got in? I, yes. got, I got in through a friend and it only took 11 years. <laughs> and I want to offer this to you, if any of you want to be a writer, keep in mind what I just said, it was, it was brief, so there was brevity, which is important. It showed the importance of friendship, which is also important in terms of getting work. And it showed the importance of perseverance. So I'll be happy to talk to you after this and tell you about what it really took to get to, to make a living as a writer and how long it took. The, the metaphor is like trying to start one of those old gasoline-powered uh, lawnmowers. You give it a start. You think it's going to work, and then it doesn't. And you just try it again, and it doesn't. So I will stay afterward. I will talk to any of you who want to be writers, but be sure to take your antidepressants, <laughs> okay? Um, well, I, I wrote down, I took some notes so I didn't just blabber on about something, and I've already used there, so. <laughs> um, so I have started in the industry, serendipity, and it really, really was. It was a different era, 1977, and there were no, just no internet, there no computers, none of that stuff. So I handed out over 60 by hand, handed out literally 60 resumes <laughs> walking around Hollywood. I, I happened to talk to a producer in a, uh, on a given morning who happened to go out to dinner with his best friend <laughs> who happened to be looking for an assistant editor at a small animation studio. And he uh, told him, well, there's this young guy there, and he's pretty enthusiastic and excited. Not a strong film background, because I was a theater major, but you might want to call him in. My resume included something about Porky Pig, Elmer Fudd, and The Roadrunner, because when I was in college, I did a touring show of those characters. He saw the resume and said, well, geez, I got to bring this guy in because he was an animation editor. He did that. I assured him I knew nothing about film. I was very honest with him. He said, I don't care. He said, because it's a small company. We have a certain way of doing things. And I'm going to hire you. I know I can teach you. And here I am, like, well, almost 50 years later in the business with that. And with that story, I just want to tell you guys, I had when you when you hand out resumes or, or you know, send it in a file, don't be hesitant to use something about you that makes you unique, that's an eye catcher, to help you stand out. No matter how small, you might have won spelling bee in a, a contest, you know, in your county or whatever. They'll remember you a little bit more. Um, and also to visualize yourself in the business. You're already what you want to be. You're just at a very early stage of that. Look at all of us. We all have our starts and our beginnings, and here we are having done it. Uh, so that's how it really started, believe it or not. You know, for me, I gradu uh, 
from 2018 to 2020, I always wanted to work for a movie studio. And a family friend happened to be a lieutenant at security at Warner Brothers. I had never done security. I did not want to do security. But it would allow me to be working on the sets at Warner Brothers. And I said, I will take any job to get onto that lot and meet people. So for two years, I worked really gruesome, long hours doing stuff that watching construction guys build fences, but once a week or something, I'd be on a movie studio or a film premiere and I would make my connections and I would talk to people and one thing led to another, which led to casting, to talent agencies, to what I do now, but it's because I took the jobs that a lot of people weren't willing to take. They're like, I wanna be a producer, that's my first, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna do this lowly job, but I learned a lot more than I ever did in college working on the lot day in and day out and living it. And that's how I met my people and kind of got where I am today. Hi everyone, uh, my background, uh, I was very internship savvy. So I really wanted to intern and I did nine internships when I was in college. Um, I didn't know I had ADHD at the time, I was an overachiever. So that aha moment will come to me at the age of 26 a few, few years ago. But um, I have a family member who's worked in the entertainment business, uh, specifically the record industry for my entire life. Um, and they were lovingly able to push my resume forward to the publicity department at Atlantic Records in 2015. And I was a student here. I was the very first uh, more part college uh, journalism student to intern at a record label uh, in the journalism program and kind of paved the way for the internship advice and uh, just go doing one internship after another. And yeah, that's kind of how I got my start. I really wanted to work in PR and I really wanted to work in the entertainment industry. Uh, I was at Warner Music Group for three semesters. I was at CBS Television for two semesters. I was at Fox Television and 20th Century Fox for three semesters before uh, the Disney acquisition. And then my last internship was at NBC Universal in content distribution. And so that's how I was able to find things I liked and didn't like. I worked in network ratings, found out I did not want to work in network ratings. Um, it's very analytical and a lot of data porting. Um, and so, yeah, I just kind of persevered and I ended up working in PR for a few years and then took a pivot and found my way into talent acquisition slash HR at NBC in early 2022 and I haven't looked back. That kind of reminded me, I, I actually did start out trying to get into PR because I have a marketing degree and what happened was uh, I traded my bartending skills because coming right out of college, I waitressed, bartended, hosted, and made some connections. I ended up getting a job at the Hard Rock Cafe in New York as a manager because they had a lot of events and no one else wanted to do it because they just were restaurant managers. So I did that. Eventually I ended up doing a lot of backstage and people would say, how long have you done this? And I'm like, two hours. <laughs> and I realized I had a really good talent dealing with people, kind of doing that. I do come from a theater background. I did all theater all through high school and college uh, in front of people. And so what happened was I went online back in the day. Mandy.com was one of the sources, but I also looked up cool jobs. There was really, I think there might still be around a website that said cool jobs because I wanted a cool job. <laughs> and so when it said entertainment TV, it listed the Directors Guild training program which was describing pretty much everything I did except without cameras, you know, running around multiple hours dealing with people. And so I said, that's it, I'm gonna get into this program, not realizing that a couple thousand people apply and there's like 10 to 20 openings a year. So two or three years of doing that, applying, I didn't get in, I said, that's it, I'm choosing East Coast or West Coast, I was from New Jersey, moved out here, ready to sleep on couches, work for free as a PA, and that was the year that I made it all the way through the, the interview process and got in. And then the next uh, three or four years, all of my work was provided by the Directors Guild. I worked as a, an assistant director in that capacity, and the deal was we had to make 400 verified work days, at which case we could then get membership into the Guild, and that was 2002 when I drove my little Honda out here. And I've been working ever since. 
But it was just like Bridget said, pivoting. I did one thing, learned some skills, kind of met people, and kept going and kept going, and was willing to do whatever it took. And then eventually, kind of said, "Oh, okay, this is this is this is I'm pretty good at this. This is what I want to do." Hi. <coughs> so my career started pretty much right out of high school. I um, I was taking a year off from after graduating high school and looking for some work, and I had a family member that was a producer, associate producer on a low-budget B film, and asked if I wanted to be a PA. And I said, Sh definitely, I want to be a PA. So I took the job, and I was getting coffee and running around doing everything for uh, everything a PA does. And um, they then asked me if I wanted to work in the editing room. And I said, absolutely. So then I went and got a job, and I worked with a gentleman named Doug Hines, who used to edit the Mary Tyler Moore Show. And he had, I think he had won seven Emmys, and he was doing this um, part-time, as like it was his time off from his regular show. And he trained me to be an assistant. And from there, I just kept getting job after job after job, and, and I never looked back. So that's where I got my start. Talk about pivoting. It's funny. I started out as assistant editor for Robert Florio. And uh, one day, they needed an extra person for Loop Group. And they looked around and said, hey, Marce, come on in. We'll use you. I'm like, oh, I've never done this before. I was so nervous and everything to perform. and. Um, after doing it a few times, it felt so natural. I felt like I had found my calling. This is what I was meant to do. <laughs> and you know, all through school, I had gotten good grades, but always said at the bottom of my report card, Darcy talks too much in class. <laughs> <laughs> and I never knew what to do with that. And accidentally pivoting from assistant editor to voiceover artist. Alrighty, for the next couple round of questions, once we reach the end, you can keep it and then we'll start answering from, the, yes. Alrighty, so the next question we have, do you think an associate's degree is enough to have a successful career in entertainment or do you recommend a particular university program that you recommend for theater, film, TV, radio, and media students? I mean, you, you heard from Mr. Florio down there that he started right after high school, but he was lucky enough to have someone in the family who was, who was willing to hire him. Um, going back to what I said before about friends, the longer you're in college, the more likely you will be to make friends, and those friends might very well be people that you will still be hanging around with and will still have worked with when you're my age, which is into retirement. So. By all means, you know, if, if you don't have the relative, uh, go stick to the university as long as you can because there are more opportunities there to um, get you involved in different things. For me, I, was, I wanted to make movies, but I also wrote for the school paper, and the school paper allowed me to interview um, movie people, and that is where I got my first job. One of the people I interviewed, a director named Russ Meyer, eventually hired me right after the interview, said, do you need, do you need work? And was, I got a low-level job, so that did not start anything. <laughs> I remember the lawnmower metaphor, but um, it does help, okay? Yeah. Um, well, my perspective on this is that I, I think education uh, in a college is more than a trade, and you are going to get a lot of very important things, I feel, in, in a college setting. Um, the key to me was always, and it really did work, I always worked in the industry, in an industry, while I was in college. Uh, when I was in college, I was a theater major, uh, as I said, and there was, summer stock was a form of theater that was very prominent. 
and there's a, the movie with Summer Stock, Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney. Literally, it's in a barn in Connecticut or something. Well, that's exactly what I did. I worked in Summer Stock Theater in a barn in Connecticut where we did 10 or 12 shows a season. That's one a week where we'd be performing, building sets, and rehearsing for all summer. And then I would go back to college and I would get the academic application of my craft and, and, and more importantly, my art form, which I believe is really important for us to understand what we're working in and what we want to work in, what its potential is in reaching people and telling stories and, and you know, bringing ideas. And, and I, I believe that both are really important in becoming a well-rounded individual in, in the industry. So I advocate college and take advantage of every, I, I had the unusual opportunity of being the first student at the University of Richmond to be in every, every show my first two years in college, because I loved it. And I'm sure you love what you do, so do it. You know, enjoy it and do it while you're there. You know, for me, uh, Moore Park College, I didn't get an AA, I just got degrees to transfer to CSUN. Uh, Moore Park College for me was for me to just figure out what do I even want to do, what do I like, what do I not like, more importantly. I took a business class. I dropped out of that. I was like, I don't like numbers or this or that. And then like my last semester, I fell in love with film because I did theater originally. And then Cal State Northridge, you know, it's not the degree that matters. It's what you do in that time until you get your degree. And CSUN gave me an opportunity where uh, I was made friends with the head of the film department. And he said, uh, I have a buddy of mine, Frederica Lapenda. He's looking for an intern. He helps produce the Beverly Hills Film Festival. I was like, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. And I went down there and I worked with some big, you know, movie stars and I was working at Grauman's Chinese Theater running the Beverly Hills Film Festival. And now I am help produce it now and it's about five years that I've been producing the Beverly Hills Film Festival. And it came through CSUN of just make, talking to your teachers, getting them to trust you, to like you, to give you that opportunity that they might not give every other student they don't know. And then on the side note, you know, I actually applied to the Director's Guild training program. And I had gone all the way to the FAR interviews where I interviewed with a panel, about 10 or 12 of them. They were in New York at the time. Very scary. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I didn't know they had a West Coast program and I was in LA at the time, so that's my mess up. But they had, we, this was right before COVID, I had gotten in and then they had to cancel it because of COVID. And, but again, there's different things like that as well, that if you don't have a degree, but you can still apply to programs like this. So it's not really the degree, it's what you do with the time while you're in college and the connections you make. So I have a very nuanced look at education, um, being that I work in recruiting now, but also I wanted to, want everyone to know that it's okay to go to community college it's okay to go to a state school it's okay like I know it can be very daunting when you're at like CSUN for example and feeling overshadowed by like uh, USC UCLA Pepperdine LMU uh, Chapman all of these other big schools that have a lot of money and established uh, like reputations, I want to know, let you know that CSUD is a very reputable college if you want to pursue film, like Variety, the, the trade has rate of rated uh, CSUN's film program over and over again as one of the top 100 film programs uh, in Variety, which is like massive. So I, if some people don't wanna go to CSUN because it's quote unquote commuter school, I kinda felt that way too a little bit, but I found my niche, which was journalism PR and I minored in marketing. Um, and I want to echo what my colleagues have said on this panel is do what you can in college. Like, yes, get the degree because you want to have something to fall back on. Don't just major in something that you don't want to major in. Like, I know a lot of people are like, oh, I just majored in business and it's just a generic uh, thing, sorry, or communications. Um, 
please find something you're passionate about like and go with it and do the extracurriculars and do that because from a, a recruitment perspective i was a part of the student news media i did the more park radio here i did the student newspaper i was everywhere and nowhere at the same time it was great um and then i did extracurriculars at csun i was a part of prssa which is the public relations student society of america like super long title and I went to conferences, I did all the things, and I participated in uh, contests and got like a gold key, which was very important at the time from PRSSA. So like those extracurriculars ended up landing me like good references, and I was able to meet people who worked in the PR industry. Oh, you were a part of PRSSA? I was a part of PRSSA. So like finding those extracurriculars and being able to network with people who are in those areas is very important. So if you're a part of the film club, if you're a part of uh, the student news media or whatever it may be, like go with it and put yourself into everything because those things are a great way to gain experience and your courses can be used as like uh, a resume booster, a LinkedIn booster or like a portfolio or something like if you've done student films or if you've written a really cool script or uh, if you've done like a good marketing analysis presentation, I don't know. You could use that as like your sample work for job interviews, and those are important. So building a portfolio is important from your classwork if you cannot get an internship. And so here's the lens of the recruiter in me. Um, it doesn't matter what school you go to, just as long as you get the degree, like it doesn't matter. We, I've had people who I've scheduled interviews for who just have a GED and just wanna be a PA. And like, it's awesome that NBC will take a take a beat on somebody who didn't uh, get an AA or uh, a BA or whatever it is. But then you also have roles where you have to have an MBA or I don't know, something specific. So I can see both ways, but my encouragement to you is to complete your AA and transfer to get your bachelor's degree, if at all humanly possible. And I, I actually did get a marketing degree and a psychology degree because um, I was told all along, you know, I, even though I was doing acting and stuff like that, it was always get a good job, you know, get, get a real job. <laughs> and so what I was doing was, uh, in fact, I went to a small university in New England and I was on a full scholarship for business. So I took as many classes as I could and then I hated it. It just wasn't for me. And I transferred to Virginia Tech, at which point I had a little more freedom. I did. I, I was on, let's see, I think it was a five-year plan, which was Star Trek, and then it became Lost in Space, because I actually went five and a half years, because I had the requirements, but because I had transferred, and I used every opportunity, every class, I took a lot of psychology, I took film studies, I took everything else to try to explore what I really wanted to do. And then when I got out of college, I did go into advertising and marketing and public relations, and I hated it. And a number of years later is when I discovered, you know, I was doing, in all my free time, all my hobbies revolved around concerts, charitable events, and I was always backstage, or I was performing, or I was running Spotlight, but I still had the real job. And eventually, when I traded and went to the Hard Rock Cafe, it gave me a little bit of leeway, and that's when I was like, it's not too late. You know, I can still, and I made a huge career. Most people have a middle life crisis, they get a motorcycle. I moved to California and got a whole new career. And circling back, because I've been on, uh, there's crew stories if you ever uh, want to vicariously look through what everyone does in film, it's on Facebook. And people come on and say, should I go to school? Should I do this? And I said, absolutely. Because what I do now running sets and being responsible for the safety uh, of the crew and all the actors, I did not have the maturity when I was in my 20s. Absolutely, I would have failed because I thought I knew everything, I knew nothing. Now I know I know nothing. <laughs> I fake it really well. And so everything that you do, regardless of what your classes are, find what you love, get the degree. It doesn't have to be nothing Nothing is, I, I really, I choked on my, my first uh, 
my second interview for the DJ training program because I was like, <gasps> if I don't get into this program, my career's over, this is it, this is my only chance. And so just remember, you know, tomorrow's a new day. You can change yourself, you can find it, you know, go down a different avenue. The only thing, whatever you're doing, do it to the best that you can. Even if you hate what you're doing, because people will see the work ethic. They'll see your personality. So they'll see through that, and that will get you forward. But learn, every place you go, and like I said, never be afraid to change. Never be afraid to figure out a new thing to do. Um, it's okay. And I look back and all of my going down the wrong roads built so much experience that now I use every day on set. Bartending, public relations. I dressed up like Barney as a dinosaur once, only once. But that too gave me an experience. So whatever you do, learn. I don't know what that says, but my wife got three motorcycles. <laughs> Better than her husband. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not qualified to answer this question, <laughs> but I, I will say that um, having my wife go to school here has been um, a plus for me because I've been, um, I, I write some projects, I've been working on a few scripts, and she takes a look at them, and ha having gone through the writing program and through some of the other programs here, she looks at them and, and can guide me and help me and, and um, share with what she's learned from school where I'm making mistakes because I don't have that education. So um, an education, I think, although I didn't have it to get where I am today, I think is extremely valuable. And I would say, please pursue that education, and, and it'll help you in your career. Absolutely. <laughs> um, the question was a degree. OK, so it's about relationships, right? Who you know. Always the stories you hear. It's who you know. And for me, that was the case. I didn't start out uh, pursuing an education in this field, although once I became a voiceover artist and started having more interest in directing and producing and writing, I realized I needed to go to school. And so I went to school. Did a lot of things in between, like you said, Joanne. <laughs> and, um, it has helped me in so many other ways other than just what I'm pursuing. And so I highly recommend definitely going. I wish I would have done it the other way. I wish I would have gone to school first and had that behind me. And now here I am at this age having to pursue that. And um, it's who you know, though, too. <laughs> Thank you. Our third question is, what qualities do you think are looked for in potential candidates seeking employment within the industry? Well, you can't be afraid to talk to people, huh? <laughs> you have to be able to introduce yourself at any given moment. Timing is everything. You never know who you're going to meet, where you're going to meet them and you have to be able to present yourself in that very moment. Um, so the question was what qualifications you need to, what skills? Yes. Um, honestly, I think you just need to be willing to start at the bottom and work your way up. Uh, I don't think anybody should expect to walk in and, and be an executive or be a director or be a producer right away I think you have to start someplace and, and work your way up and find the area you're interested in and start focusing that way and see if you can get a job as an assistant in that area um, or another area. So honestly, um, the, the key to me is just try to find a job at the bottom level and start working your way up. Yeah, and, and along those lines, I kind of touched on it. Whatever you do, even if it's, you know, working at McDonald's, 
do your best. Have a good work ethic. That's what people will see. You know, have a good personality. Be friendly. Along those lines, when I went for the DJ training program, everyone was like, oh, you know, I'm going to study, you know, coach me. And what I realized was be the best you. I'm very outgoing. I'm kind of chatty, bit of a stand-up comedian without trying to be <laughs> a stand-up comedian. That works for me. I unarm people because I can make them laugh. But if you're a really good listener, it's okay to be quiet. You don't have to all be outgoing and loud. You know, being quiet's okay too, because you can be a good listener. You can be a good observer. So just figure out your own personality and your own skills and work on those. Confidence. Confidence doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you're big and out and going out like that. Confidence is just, you know, knowing wh who you are and having confidence in your strengths, falling back on that. And uh, I would really say work ethic and being true to yourself, you know, and having confidence, you know, in who you are. Figure out your talents. You, we all have them. And uh, don't be ashamed if your talents are different than somebody else's because that's how, that's how the industry works. You'll find yourself falling into the job that fits that. I'm an AD, there's four different, there's so many different ADs. There's the first AD with the director. There's the second AD that does all the paperwork and all the scheduling. The second second, like myself, I'm the one wrangling hundreds of background. There's an additional that might be in the back in the base camps handling the actors. So it's the same job. We have all this, we can do any of those jobs, but you fall into what works best for you and your, uh, your personality and your skills. So from a recruitment POV and also as a candidate perspective, be detail oriented, detail oriented, detail oriented, uh, detail oriented, be detail oriented. Literally, it's something that you will learn over time, like in your coursework, um, being able to catch the little details is so important. Um, especially working in media and it's so fast paced, like having someone be that gut check and seeing the final approval before it goes live or reaches the vice president, like being able to check your own work and copy edit and de like become your own critic. Also ask for feedback, be like, hey, can you please look at this? and be receptive to feedback because you may not uh, realize that there's something that you could be working on. Um, and then writing. I know a lot of folks just want to be an editor or want to be a director or work in video or what a, or graphic design. I implore everybody to ju not just take your general English classes. Please take a media writing class, take a journalism class, take a public relations writing class, take a technical writing class or business uh, writing class because you need to know how to write a memo. You need to know how to write an email. You need to know how to uh, be poised and be professional. Um, I know that everybody here has an email and sometimes you can be very f informal when communicating with your professors, but you need to have that skill set and be professional and you can't just tech, like do text slang um, or like I am people, like I'm on Slack, which is an instant messaging service and I communicate with my folks all day, every day. But I have to say detail oriented and writing is so important. Um, whether you take it here at Moore Park or wherever you transfer, those two are gonna be your biggest thing. And then also working in media and entertainment, you have to be a people person. You don't have to be outgoing, but you have to be putting yourself out there. You have to be the first person, not the first person, but you want to be out there. You want to say hello. You want to introduce yourself because you are your brand. If you, you're building your brand here in college, so that's something that's very important. So those are my tips and tricks from a former college student and now on the recruitment side. Yeah, I didn't, you know, I... A funny thing, she mentions the email because that's something I had to learn later on. Like, I was like, oh, I can't say thanks with an X. I got to say thank you. No, but um, I'm good on that now. But I think uh, just to kind of echo what everyone else was saying, uh, A, being outgoing. Again, you don't have to be the loudest person in the room, but looking for those opportunities, knocking on those doors, giving 110% in whatever you do. 
uh, and staying up and like I read the Hollywood Reporter variety or whatever you're interested in, stay up to current events so you know how to have an intelligent conversation with someone about that subject. Um, but for me, you know, when I worked at Warner Brothers, it's like I didn't want to do some of the things I was doing, but I gave 110%. And I would go to the, I would walk around with the confidence like, oh, there's my office. I mean, it's not mine yet, but it's going to be one day, you know? And it's not a cockiness to it. It's that it's kind of like manifesting your destiny and walking around that it's, it's there. I just don't have it yet. And not being afraid to talk to someone in the cafeteria line. I didn't know who this guy was, Tony Sepulveda, and he... I would talk to him sometimes at lunch while we were at the salad bar. I had no idea who he was. He just saw some random security guard. He's like, okay. And turns out he was the head of casting for Warner Brothers Television. And after I left Warner Brothers, he hired me to be his assistant. And it was just because I talked to him a few times and got to know him personally. You know, so it, you just have to be outgoing and look for those opportunities because no one's gonna open the door for you. Sometimes you gotta kick it in yourself and you know, make those opportunities available. Yeah, I reiter reiterate everything everybody said. It, it really is incredibly important. Um, and a c couple of components. One thing that I have always believed in is be genuine. Really lo love people. I mean, we're all amazing entities. <laughs> we all have incredible stories. We all have personal lives and you know, I mean, that's what we're all kind of walking through this together. And, and be excited about that. Um, and that will be reflected, you know, when you're dealing with someone. They'll understand that you're, you really care about them as a person, too, not just their title or whatever. Um, and if you remember when I told you the story of how I was, you know, I got the job. It was, I, I, I can show you my resume. It was like really a taxi driver. Huh? Um, it was not film heavy at all. It was film absent. But he said, well, he's a young guy there. He's really enthusiastic, you know. Um, and so enthusiasm, genuine enthusiasm, you know. Genuinely be excited about what they have to say and what you're going to be learning and the, what they're about. Uh, and tenacity is, like, really important, as they said. No matter what you're doing, be tenacious. Do it. Do it really well, really well. And, and learn from what you're doing, because every, everything applies, as everybody has said. Yeah, build yourself up as a person. It's fun. <laughs> you know, it makes it more fun, and everybody wants to work with you, you know, that way. That's what I would say. Okay, you're not going to want to hear this, but the entertainment business is not a nine to five job. <laughs> The uh, production people back me up on that. It's more of a five to nine job. So you wake up when it's dark and you know barely have enough time to get eight hours of sleep in. So keep that in mind. The good side of that is that working under those conditions, you may go away to a different city for a year, as I did a long time ago, and then come back with enough money to buy a house for cash. So there's a good side to it and a bad side to it. Anyway, keep the, please keep that in mind. The other thing is, is there anybody here who, who wants to be a writer? Okay. No, no, no. E even, for, even writers have to keep those horrible hours, so just don't worry about that. But there is a lot of compensation for it. The other thing to remember is, and I, I wish I had known this earlier, your writing isn't enough. As, every, as half the people here have said, you also have to be the kind of person that people, other people want to work with. It isn't just enough to, you know, here's the script, you know, I'll, I'll mail it to you and then go make the movie. They're going to be working with you and you have to be the kind of person who other people want to work with. And I don't know how you do that. It took me forever. So good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Our next question is, what software or equipment do you recommend for students before they enter working in the industry? Well, that's easy. Word and um, final draft for your computer, for, for writing. Um, word for when you write your outline, and then final draft for when you write your script. 
It's simple, it's straightforward, and who knows, two, three years from now, it'll be something entirely different, but right now, it's word and final draft, and that's it. Sorry, I wish I could tell you something funnier or more interesting, but it will change. I started, I started my career with a manual typewriter, so the, the hardware will change. Anyway, good luck. Um, yeah, and my career has really taken all sorts of very intriguing twists and turns. And, and I would be categorized as a post-production person now. I, I was an editor in actual production editing and shows and things like that. Uh, and then I moved into archiving and preservation and content uh, research uh, with a specialty in Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies. That's, that's what I've been at Warner Brothers for 37 years on. Um, and so my tools are very different. Um, I would say this. Um, at, at a big corporation like Warner Brothers, metadata <laughs> and data just like drives the industry. It's unbelievable. Smartsheet, all of these applications and programs. There are so many kids your age. Um, I, I, I'm surrounded by millennials and Gen Xs, and I'm definitely the old guy on the floor, that's for sure. And they all have a savvy for these programs to push data, QC data, delivery to Netflix or whomever we're dealing with. And they get an industry in doing that. And everyone who wants to be a writer or a director or something else. But in the meantime, they're pulling down a decent salary, they're in the business, they're in a major corporation. So really learn as much as you can about data and how to move it around and what it is and what the files are and all of that stuff. I think that's really, really important uh, in this time. Myself, because I started uh, in the prehistoric period when we actually delivered on film, um, it's fun to learn that. Learn the history of what we do. It's fascinating. I could tell you many stories about old negatives and old porky pig black and white cartoons and soundtracks and all that. It's exciting to know you come from that line and that's what you're doing. Remember, all of the metadata and everything else is backed up by something real that artists created and you're just kind of manipulating and working with it. Uh, and that's a lot of fun. So that's what I would say. Um, you know, I've done so many different jobs these past five, six years that it depends on what I did. So as a talent agent and talent manager, I was had to know how to use Actors Access, Casting Frontier, um, LA Casting, et cetera. Uh, Excel, know how to use Excel. I hate Excel, but I'm learning it still, and it's so smart, but it's good for you to know. Uh, movie magic, budgeting, and scheduling. I had to learn how to do that. That was very important for me, especially for the DGA program. And then I think, you know, and since I work with social media now at this time, I think it's important that you, we all know how uh, big social media is, and you don't have to be an influencer, but it's important for you to understand how, you know, Instagram and how YouTube and how all this stuff now is very invasive in the, you know, the film studio, the Warner Brothers and the Universals and how they all combine right now because they're trying to target your guys' generation, Gen Zers, and they're not necessarily doing it through a poster board or a billboard now. It's done through social media, and it's really fascinating to see how we're targeting your guys' age groups through social media. So maybe just understanding the power of it there's a lot of bad that comes from it, but there's also a lot of good that if you have a product or yourself that you want to sell, you can do that and build yourself as a brand. Uh, from a public relations perspective, uh, learning Scission or Muckrack or Meltwater, uh, though the, these platforms are basically journalist databases where you can find it to pitch somebody. So let's say you want to pitch somebody at Vogue or the LA Times. Um, most major PR agencies or PR departments have a subscription to these uh, databases. And it's basically uh, the telephone book, but for journalists. Uh, we have radio, magazine, even some influencers are in there as well. So that's um, one thing. And then another, Grammarly. 
every there's a free version. Download it, get it. Literally, Grammarly will save your life. Um, I have it installed in my Microsoft Outlook. I have it installed on my Google Chrome. I have out autocorrect installed in everything you can think of because I write stream of consciousness and I don't make sense. Um, so those are two things. And then uh, from a marketing perspective, learn content management systems. So like a base camp or uh, there's other, I'm trying to, I'm forgetting what other stuff out there, but basically it's like pro a project management tool. It's, you're able to see like the process, how people submit files, how you can, it, it's basically just holding data. If you can do Dropbox or Box, you can do Basecamp. It, it's pretty transferable. So those are my uh, tidbits from a marketing PR and uh, perspective. And then from a, from an industry thing, you have to learn to be empathetic. And I know that's not a technical skill, but you need empathy to work in a people and media based world. You have to be sympathetic. You have to understand like DEIA. You have to be open and curious. And empathy is not something to be taught, but you need to be comp a compassionate person. And I think that just goes down to like being a people person or like learning as you go. I know I sound like a grandma saying that. I'm 28 years old, I promise. Um, but empathy is so important. And then I'll take it back. Uh, basics, word, and Excel. They're huge. Everything kind of builds off of that. Movie magic. I've been doing this over 20 years. Movie magic, everyone comes up with a new how to run a set how to do this, how to schedule, and everyone thing goes, everything goes back to movie magic. We keep hoping that somebody comes along with a more efficient program, but, and there's some out there. There's um, Cinespace, there's Scriptation, there's a lot of different programs, but movie magic is still right now the basic, and Word and Excel. Excel can be your friend or your enemy, I hate it too, but, it, it can, at the end of the night, save you a lot of uh, time. The other thing is, coming from a marketing advertising background, everything was Apple, Apple, Apple. And you know what? It's not all Apple, Apple, Apple. I know that's kind of blaspheme, but um, for me, I work on a set, I beat the crap out of my computer, and I'm gonna leave and go on set, and then somebody else is gonna work on my computer. It's gonna be sitting in a dusty trailer. The first time uh, my, my Apple went down and I didn't have the money, I just got a really good laptop PC, and everyone was like, <gasps> oh, I almost lost a job because the person who was above me said, oh, well, how can you do the production reports? How can you send emails? And she really was, and I said, well, if that becomes a problem, I'll get an Apple. But in the meantime, for my work computer, it's still a PC. Would I love to have an Apple? Absolutely. But get a good, solid computer, even if it's an iPad, or, oops, I went back there. Um, but something like that to work with. But don't let somebody shame you. If your computer works and you're smart, you'll get it done. It's not about spending the most amount of money. You know, get something that works. And then when you make the money, get what, you know, maybe one with all the bells and whistles. Um, for the writers, I agree. <coughs> Word and final draft, for sure. Final draft makes your life so much easier when you're writing something. <laughs> um, as an editor, the uh, tool that is used most in the profession is Avid. Um, there are other tools, but Avid is the primary tool for professional editors at the moment. They do change. It changes quite often. Um, when we first started, uh, when I was first starting on NCIS Los Angeles, we used Final Cut Pro for the first two to three seasons. But then um, Apple changed Final Cut Pro and it became, um, it became more of a tool for colorists instead of a tool for editors. So um, we moved off of that back onto Avid and, and we've used Avid now for, um, for the rest of the show until it got canceled, but all the other shows do Avid pretty much. Well, for me, because of what I do, I don't really have tools that I would recommend. But because I am a student again and had to go back to school, 
my son, who is also an alumni here, as well as my daughter, they uh, had encouraged me to get Grammarly first thing, <laughs> which really, really does help. <laughs> um, and taking a writing course helped as well, but um, I, I really don't have tools to recommend as far as voiceover because the people in sound take care of the mics and the, uh, they do everything. You, you're just using your voice. Question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So mistakes are inevitable. So what have you learned from your mistakes while pursuing your career or even while working? Oh, mistakes happen all the time in the moment. And later you think about it and you go, oh, I won't do that again. <laughs> huh. But in what I do, uh, mistakes can happen in the moment, and you have to just keep carrying on. You, you don't get a second chance sometimes. And you can kind of maybe fix it, or you know, maybe they'll do another take, hopefully. But um, yeah, you can answer that. <laughs> well, I don't make mistakes, so. <laughs> um, well, honestly, uh, the one thing I look back on in, in terms of my career, um, I think, is an ego mistake. And um, that mistake was, um, I, I did a lot of movies of the week at the beginning of my career, and a lot of friends of mine were going on to series, and I thought, well, series is below me. Movies of the week are the way to go. And as I look back on my career, I, I realized the the big mistake was I should have gotten into series sooner because I could have had a different growth um, uh, trajectory at that point because I did want to get into directing. And once I've got, gotten into series, I started having an opportunity to direct more. When you do movies of the weeks or movies, you're, you're basically doing uh, editing of that job and you don't have opportunities to move into other positions. So. Um, like I said, I think a mistake of ego um, hurt me because if I got into series earlier, I'd probably be directing a lot more. Um, everybody makes mistakes. We all make mistakes. It's all how we uh, deal with it. Um, the best I can tell you is if you make a mistake, own up to it. Uh, I equate it with uh, white out on a formal dress. A girl borrowed my dress when I was in college, and it was very 80s big white bow, taffeta, chiffon, you name it. And I got it back, and there was this odd stain. It was like this off-color yellow stain. And I thought, I was like, what happened to my dress? And she said, oh, I was doing my makeup and my mascara rolled down the front, and then I tried to clean it, but that wasn't working, so I just used white out. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful pictures. The white out worked for the evening. And then slowly, by the time I got the dress back, the whiteout had turned and stained the dress permanently. So if she had owned up to it and uh, you know didn't try to conceal it, maybe it could have been saved. But you know, obviously, the dress was trashed. In work, it's the same way. Um, your mistake will come out eventually. It might not get blamed on you. But especially working on a set, there's so many things that happen quickly. Uh, people's safety. So when you make a mistake, own up to it quickly. You don't have to make an announcement to the entire crew. Find somebody you trust. For me, I misread a call sheet. Um, I don't know if you all know, call sheet is like the Bible. All the ins, outs, times, everything that's working for the day, equipment, um, props, wardrobe, everything, and the actor's call times. I misread 10 o'clock as 1 o'clock. So I gave an actor a 1 p.m. call time, which means he gets there at 1 p.m., goes into hair and makeup, and then is ready about, depending on the person, 1.30, 2 o'clock. 9.30, 10 o'clock, we're like, where's Danny? Why isn't Danny here? And I, all of a sudden, it just, I was like, oh my. I gave him the wrong call time. Immediately went to somebody above me. They called him, thank God he lived close in town. He got in. And fortunately, it was not the first scene of the day. So we had a little built-in time, not a lot. He got there, got into makeup. He made it to set. No one knew. 
except me, the actor, and the person I told. Crisis averted. If I had just buried that and said nothing, everyone would have known. It would have ruined, yeah, it would have been a big deal. So when you see something, say something, like I said, find somebody you trust. The other side of that, if you make a mistake, own up to it and move on. Don't dwell on it. Don't go around apologizing to everybody. Oh, I'm so sorry that I gave Danny the wrong time. That was all my fault. The whole day was, no. Own up to it, take it, move on. And I guarantee somebody is going to make another mistake after you. Hopefully bigger. <laughs> They'll forget about your mistake. So those are the two things. Own up to it. Let somebody know. There's no mistake that can't be fixed. The only mistake that can't be fixed is a mistake we don't know about until it's too late. So I'm a perfectionist at the end of the day. Um, I, when I didn't know I had ADHD, I still hold myself to a very high standard. So when your girl messes up, she falls flat. Like you go from being on the mountain and I'm already on the ground and been run over by a truck 10 times. Like that's how making a mistake is for me. Um, I want to reiterate that you don't need to put so much pressure on yourself. Like I was that person, oh my God, if I don't get an A, I'm not going to like survive. Like I was that girl. And yes, I do have a val an LA Valley girl accent. Like that is, that is me. Um, but I want you to know that it is not the end of the world if you don't get the A. It is not the end of the world if you don't aren't able to meet an expectation. Um, making a mistake, you will learn from it and you will be able to overcome whatever it is, no matter how big or small. I would just want you to learn from it. Don't ruminate on it, no matter how socially anxiety inducing and depressing it is uh, fr coming from your fellow ADHD or slash anxiety ridden human. Um, you will be able to overcome it, own it, own your truth and you will learn from it and you will can move on like no one's perfect and I can't emphasize that enough like the entertainment industry is imperfect and we're all beautifully imperfect in our own perfect way I know that's quite a weird saying but just want you to know don't, don't hold yourself to such a high expectation every single day because it will wear on you and that's when the mistakes will happen when you hold yourself to such a high expectation every single day. Burnout is a thing. Remember to do self-care. Remember to recognize stress. Remember, recognize your self-worth. Like if you are starting to get to burnout or if you're super stressed out and if you're the one who's raising your head out, yes, 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 yes. Don't overwhelm yourself. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with your supervisor, professor, whatever it is. Like be true to yourself and don't try and overcompensate and do everything. It's okay to say no, because if you're doing everything, you will make more mistakes, um, taking it from somebody who always would raise her hand and do everything, things will slip. So take it one step at a time. Um, you know, I think when it comes to mistakes, it's also what can we do to not make mistakes? And I think a big thing is, is like she was saying, uh, slowing down in the morning. I feel like sometimes we're rushing and we're not, wait, okay, wait, take a breath. What am I doing? Sometimes even the biggest thing is spotting the mistakes before they happen, whether it's on a set or in an email, or uh, if you don't read the contract all the way and you spot that mistake and the client's already signed the contract, you know what I mean? It's things like that. So trying to spot the mistakes before they happen, slowing down, taking self-care mentally and physically without burnout, because that's gonna happen. And then if you do make a mistake, realize you've made it, tell someone, you don't need to announce it like Joanne said, and you just need to take a minute, why did I make that mistake? Look back, why did I make that mistake? Where was I at mentally? What was I doing? How can I not make that mistake again? Because the entertainment industry is a very loving and forgiving industry. I'm just kidding, they're not. <laughs> that I'm saying, my point being is, is that if you make a mistake, you own it, you better to learn from that mistake. If you make that same mistake a week later, they are not happy and you are done. Not in every case, but in a lot of the cases, it's rare enough that they give you a second chance sometimes. So you need to learn from your mistakes 
and implement something in your life schedule that can help accommodate so you don't make those mistakes again. Make friends. It's really important because if you make friends, people will want to help you. If you've made enemies, they are waiting for you to fall. So coming from, I'm so many mistakes that I've made and where the actor who I gave the wrong call time loved me. I loved him. I loved his wife, thank God, because she was the one like, I'll just wake him up, it'll be okay. So make friends. They will help you. But also, it's Hollywood. The wolves are barking at the door. So when you make a mistake, sometimes people will, you know, they, they, if, if you've made enemies or you have caused other people problems, they will use that as an opportunity to get rid of you. So, but if, you, you know, if you're that guy that everyone loves, girl, that everyone loves, they'll help you. They don't, if you made a mistake, they'll get over it. They'll help you. Uh, one more tidbit. So in the friends category, if you're like really chummy with your like coworkers or, and the, you'll consider them friends, like I go to happy hour with my coworkers like once a month, use them as your sounding board because you could be saying something and they're like, yo, that, that, that ain't okay. Do not say that like that, like bounce your ideas off of your coworkers that you're comfortable with and would consider friends um, because that is a safe space most of the time. Um, obviously pick and choose people you want to open up to, but being able to practice what you're saying or be like, hey, what do you think of this scenario before you present said scenario or go forward with it? At least you can have that gut check or you can even do that with your manager or supervisor if you're like super tight with them. Um, I keep, that has saved me so many times by doing a gut check like that, by echoing my ideas to, or my coworkers will come to me and be like, hey, what do you think of that? I'll be like, yeah, that's great, but you should also add this or add that so that you don't sound like you're just begging for something or whatever the case may be. Like have a support system that you can go to so that if you do make a mistake, at least it's like you went through checks and balances before it made it out to whatever the scenario is. And I'm, no, I'm just kidding. Well, obviously, don't make mistakes. <laughs> That's preferable. But, but of course, you're going to make mistakes. And, and as everybody has said, well, I, I have a couple of perspectives. One of them, as you were, we were talking, since we are, you know, talking movies here, among other things, um, streetcar named Desire. A line from it. I have always depended upon the kindness of others. That's what it's about when you make mistakes. You hope that you're honest. You, you, you talk earnestly about the mistake that you made. And you hope that the people are going to be kind. Uh, some aren't. <laughs> and there's nothing you can do about that. Except always, always, always know that you gave 150%. If you gave 150% and you do every day, you've done your best. And sometimes circumstances <laughs> just don't allow it. I remember one of the first things I did, I was working animation and we used to have uh, you know, piles of animation cells. And I would be given the cells and way back then, in order to go to FedEx, you had to go to the airport, LAX in Hollywood at five o'clock in the evening. And I'd be handed this stuff and they'd say, Rick, this has got to get to LAX at, you know, whatever. And you, you, you just, you know, do I have a helicopter? No, I, I'm, I can't make it there, but I have to try. And I, I got in my car and I was zooming th down to get to LAX and, and I, and I didn't look long enough crossing Santa Monica Boulevard. And a car was coming, and I was in such a rush that it just T-boned me on the side. And I had to go back. That's a wonderful call to go, you know, go hobbling back to the studio and say, um, oops. And, and, and I remember the producer said, Rick, you had nothing to do with that. They gave you an impossible task to do and you really tried your best. Do not feel bad, just next time say, 
I cannot make it there. I, I just can't physically get this stuff there. And another thing that's really important, I think, and I, along with everybody, every, everybody said, do not pretend you know something. Do not pretend you have an answer if you don't have an answer. There's nothing wrong with not having an answer. What's wrong is pretending you have an answer, giving a wrong answer or a misdirection, when all you have to say is, can you imagine me? I knew nothing about film. And I'm getting all these requests with that. Yeah, I can do that. Oh, yeah, this is what you do with that. I would, I would call somebody if I had time. And if I didn't have time, I would always say, I don't know that, but I'll get you an answer and get an answer. Uh, Warner Brothers, as you probably may have read, has gone through many, many transitions, <laughs> certainly in the 37 years I've been there, of ownership. So unfortunately, with that comes layoffs. Departments change massively. And if you call a department and you need an answer because it's their department, and the answer to you is, oh, I don't know, I wasn't there, I haven't been here, it's like, oh, yeah, I know, but you are there now, and you're in a t better position to get the answer to that than I am. You know, you just always be truthful. You know, I don't know, but I will get it, and then get it. The two horrible mistakes I've made were not complimenting the people who work for me and not sucking up to the people that I was working for. Um, as to that latter one, you know, you, you go to work as maybe a 25-year-old working for a guy who's 55, who's been in the business for 30 years, and you figure, well, they know what they're doing, they're, they're confident, they, they, they know everything, I don't have to tell them anything. But they're scared, too. And, and it, you know, if you find something you like about what this older person's doing, tell them, because they're, they're insecure. It's an insecure business. Um, and as far as complimenting the people who work for you, um, I was talking to my wife about this the other night. She's here now. Um, it, that's a terrible flaw on my part. And um, I, you know, I, I try to think about it. And usually, you know, part of it is that you don't get many compliments. You, what you get is your paycheck. They keep paying you, and, you know, you, you think, well, you know, I haven't fired you, Is, isn't that enough? But no, it's not enough. A lot of people do need um, positive reinforcement. And uh, I'm trying to get better, but I'm, I'm never gonna be any good at it. She's laughing, okay. Um, one other thing, this is just a personal perspective. My wife's a nurse. For 40 years, she was a nurse during COVID, during all of that stuff. So I always have remembered what we do is really, 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 really important because we make it important. And because it is important to achieve the tasks we achieve, but the difference in what we do and a mistake we may make and what her profession does and a mistake they may make is significantly and profoundly different. So sometimes when I see people running around our industry with their hair on fire over something that is either gonna work or isn't gonna work, come on, put it together, let's give it our best. If it doesn't work, I, I, I don't like finger pointing and all of that. It's useless, it's a waste. It does nothing to reconcile the problem at hand. So remember that too, that, that we are in a business that requires 100%, 150% devotion. But at the end of the day, people have to treat each other with a reality. You know, okay, we can fix this. This is fixable.
Right, thank you for sharing such wonderful advice. While we are on the topic of mistakes, are there any grand mistakes you guys have seen that have gotten people fired or any other reasons that you guys would like to explain for people getting fired in the industry? <laughs> and I w she can't talk and I won't talk. There you go. Oh. Well, I won't name names, obviously, <laughs> but but there is there was a situation. I think it's a good story, because the individual who came in was young, full of vim and vigor, and wanted to make it quickly happen for himself. And he, you know, he lost sight of teamwork, and the idea that uh, y you don't advance yourself for yourself. You advance yourself through the efforts that you all collaborate on in making it happen as a team. There's nothing more collaborative than filmmaking, I would say. So this young man <laughs> came to Warner Brothers, I'll be very vague about it, came to Warner Brothers with the intent of kind of, you know, heading up those ranks like a rocket real quickly. Unbeknownst to anybody in the department, he wrote a letter to the head of Warner Brothers, um, or an email, or whatever format it took, and brought them things up and made suggestions that no way should have gone in that route. You go through the protocol, you go through the proper people, and they'll frankly help you. And I, he was gone in a day. So remember, it is a team. You're all working as a team. You'll all help each other, and you'll be elevated with the team. When I was an intern at the record labels, there was a story the uh, vice president of human resources told every intern, this is not the person you want to be. So let me set the scene, and I'm also going to be super vague. Um, this was a marketing intern. The intern was working on a sponsorship for a music artist at the time, and they saw this contract. They thought, oh my God, this is so cool. And they took a picture of said contract with said sponsorship with said artist and posted it to their Snapchat. One of their friends saw said contract and artist that they were doing something really cool. And this was not a final thing, by the way. This is not set in stone. This was still being uh, put together. The intern's friend saw that. They're like, oh my God, so-and-so is going to be working with XYZ product. This is so amazing. One thing led to another. It went on to Twitter. It went on to Tumblr. This is ricocheted. And so by the time it came back to the intern, they were already fired because it went through legal found it, PR found it, the social media team. And mind you, this is still at like, uh, this was 2014, 2015 when this intern did it. So this wasn't even at the height of social media craze. What, when something goes viral now, like it can get two, three million hits. Now this kid just thought, just seeing this contract, that it wasn't gonna do anything. He saw, but boy, did that thing bite him and that, contract ended up being canceled. They lost the sponsorship and that intern got on the do not hire list. So if you are privy to information, know that it is confidential. If you sign an NDA, uh, if you don't understand what you're signing, ask about it, consent forms. But if you are in a confidential meeting, know that it is for your eyes and ears only. If somebody says, this can't be spoken about and let do your due diligence and don't be that intern that ruined a sponsorship with an artist. Yeah, that was me. Um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <clears throat> um, you know, I, working as a set watcher at Warner Brothers, I've seen all the production assistants running around with their heads on fire. And there, I won't name the show, but there was a show at the studio and this person who ran the show was known to be difficult. And some PAs or security or otherwise 
would get fired if you looked at this person in the eyes or if you spoke to them directly and not to the handler. And, no, uh, this is Warner Brothers lot. So um, I was privy to seeing that where someone could get fired for the smallest thing. Um, and then also I think a big thing is, is a lot of times in the entertainment industry, it, the person just kind of disappears and you go, where did Frank go? Yeah. And you're like, Frank who? And you're like, the guy that was here last, uh, we don't talk. I think a big thing is also, you know, every politics has gotten involved into everything. And I think the biggest thing that I was told was never talk about politics at work. I don't care if you're right or left or whatever. It's not a place to talk about it or religion or right now you just need to, you're just there to do your job and do your work and work with your coworkers. Even if you are not, you're in a circle or you're nearby and they're talking about stuff like that, walk away. Cause then someone will overhear and say, well, he was with them when they said this. So he must be thinking the same thing as them and they'll be gone. So stay out of it. Work is work and talk about work. Don't bring your own personal life always into everything you do. That's why it's knowing who your true friends are, who you can talk to and have a life outside of the entertainment industry. Because if you don't, you don't have those outlets to talk to those people about what you wanna do and blah, blah, blah. But a lot of people have been fired for little things or little over conversation that someone overheard and ratted them out on it. And I'll say not necessarily how not to get fired, but how not to get hired. <clears throat> I went for a job interview and it was on a location. And so um, they're actually, you're piling up all the people, they're the candidates. And what happened was um, this really sweet girl came along and she was like, ah, do you want a soda? Do you want snacks? And I said, sure, that'd be great, you know? So I went and started chatting with this young girl. Eventually went, had, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> had the interview. And everything went great. The person after me, the same sweet girl, was like, hey, do you want a snack? Do you want some sodas? And she was like, no, I just need to talk to Ralph. I just need to talk to Ralph. It was a little abrupt and rude. So fast forward, I got the job, yay. And I'm working, and the sweet little girl who was a PA working for the summer, her father was the executive producer. And she said, oh, I'm so thankful you got the job. That other girl was so mean. So always be aware you never know who you're interacting with. You don't know who they, they know. And uh, you know, treat everyone with kindness. Um, tap on that. I do a lot of background, um, working with background. And they get treated poorly, and they shouldn't, because they are so important. They're, you know, if you watch a show and it looks amazing, it's probably because there's good background. If you watch a show and it just looks a little off, it's probably because the background drew your attention away from what you know, the action was. A um, Couple days after we had a big wedding on a show, I got a note down that uh, one of the executives wanted to thank me for taking really good care of his mom. I had no idea who his mom was. During the wedding, there was a sweet little old lady who of course had, I've never done this before. I said, no problem. Stick with me, I'll show you what you need to do. Oh, made sure she got food. Treated her just like I would treat any other human being. Well, it turned out that it was one of the executive's moms. She was in town, and he thought she would just get a kick out of being on set. <laughs> and so she was one of the, the background. She was in holding, no one talked to, I mean, she was just being treated just like any of the other background. There was no distinction. There was no memo that came down and said, oh, be really nice to Mary. Mary's, you know. So you never know who you're dealing with, and you don't know who they know. So the best bet, stick to work. Don't bring opinions. Don't bring personal in. And just treat everyone with kindness. So um, <clears throat> to echo what was said earlier, I would be careful with social media and your workplace. Um, I know of a situation where there was a PA that took one of our actors home, took pictures of the house, and said, can you believe this person lives here? 
That person was fired, and that we never saw that person again. So just be careful with social media and your job. Um, <clears throat> for me also, um, I had to fire an assistant one time because the assistant was coming in late every day and hung over or whatever. And um, I warned him, and the third time, by not being professional, not being at his job when I told him he needed to be there, he was fired. So you just have to be professional, be on time, and make sure you leave social media out of your workplace. Good advice. Uh, I'm going to echo what Joanne said, um, and, and about politics. Uh, politics or something you just don't discuss at work. Everybody has a different opinion, even though you think you might all be in the same crowd. <laughs> and uh, who, who you're talking to, treat everybody the same. You never know. You never know who you're dealing with, speaking to, what they might do for you in the future. And because you were kind, you got a little step up. All right, thank you guys so much for answering the questions we have for you. We're going to open it up to the audience now, so if anyone has any questions they want to ask, just raise your hand and we'll go all around. I like Superman when I was three years old, but eventually you, you come to realize that that's just impossible to fly like that. And so Batman, <laughs> Batman, by the way, Batman was much easier to write for because he had vulnerabilities, and Superman was much tougher to write for. And as predicted, I've forgotten the rest of it. Oh, oh, uh, yeah, artificial intelligence. So far, I think it will be helpful to writers. I know that the Writers Guild went on a big strike about no, you. you we don't want management to, to hire artificial intelligence to write our scripts. But I think for beginning writers, artificial intelligence will be very useful for structure because the thing can look at other things and, and it, it can give, you, if you're a beginning writer, it can give you a sense of what your structure should be. Um, as far as it writing actual scripts, we did an experiment. Um, I have written for Superman and I, enjoy watching Curb Your Enthusiasm, so I asked artificial intelligence to combine the two, and it was terrible. It was just lame, flat jokes, and you, know, you realize it's just not gonna write scripts anytime soon. And the third part, going backwards, was? Actually, I didn't write that many episodes. I think you had it wrong. I, I story edited all of them on Batman Beyond and um, the Superman show. But in terms of writing, there, there is no time to do that. That's what you have a writing staff for. I would guess that on Superman and Batman Beyond, probably 10 scripts each, maybe. So it wasn't quite that many. I mean, you can't. I mean, maybe um, on the West Wing, the guy who was doing that would, would be able to write them all. But um, mostly you, you have a writing staff for that. And you, and you also hire freelancers. It's edited. It's it's like a, a newspaper editor or anything, you, except you're you're dealing with scripts. Is this is the script working? Could this scene be stronger? Is it too long? Is it too short? That kind of a thing. Okay, that's story editing, in, in one sentence. Okay. Are there any other questions? Go for it.
Yeah, I mean, maybe they can also speak to this a bit more because I went to Cal State Northridge and I loved it and I was terrible at applying to colleges. So that was like one of the only colleges I got into. Um, I personally liked being here in LA and making connections here because I find that I've met a lot of people who went to college in some Midwestern town who maybe doesn't have a huge, now if you're like in, in Georgia maybe where there's still a film industry there, then okay, or New York. But if you're going to like Kansas City and you make connections there, you might be able to be a big fish in a small pond, but then you come over here and those connections might not always transfer over. So there's that. And then um, about casting wise, I just think I interned and I was just submitting their talent for film and television. Like um, uh, Tom Hanks's brother, like was one of my clients and I would do sign him for all the voiceover work for Woody and all that. He would do all of that. And um, you know, it, it was fun, but I started booking them so much work because I did give 110% that then they hired me on the spot, you know, after a year of the internship to do it. And I had fun with it. I don't want to do it anymore, but it's definitely something that I enjoyed doing while I was there. So I think getting into an internship, understanding those programs, and, you know, you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of actors, it feels like, all wanting one role. It's like, how does that actor stand out? Do they have a good reel, a headshot? Are they likable? Have they worked before? Are they trying to make their own work, which is really big right now? Is that if someone's not giving you the job, are they at least doing something proactively for themselves, making their own work? Yeah. Okay. Well, it depends on how involved you are. Um, usually it's not just submitting, but it's also doing the contracts for them as well, making sure that they're there on time or if the sense like, are they working on another project, knowing the actor's schedule that, oh, even though this film's at this time, are they gonna be able to fly out? Can we make some exceptions? Talking to the other teams for them. Um, but a lot of contracts and then usually it would go off to their personal manager maybe after that happens to make sure they get on set on time. Our job was just to get them the job and after that we're kind of done with the casting process um, until there's another one that comes along. But understanding contracts is really important. You know, creator agreements, non-disclosure agreements is really big as well because in casting you're dealing with big, big projects that you need to make sure you understand what you're reading, who's it for, is it with Universal, do you know those people at Universal that you can contact? So yeah, understanding the industry and the projects coming up. Uh, just to add, um here in Los Angeles, like uh, speaking from my company, NBC Universal has writer room uh, opportunities uh, for postgraduate folks, like through NBC U Launch or uh, DreamWorks or uh, the Global Talent and Development and Inclusion Program. Like we have these programs, and other competitors, like Warner Brothers, has a writers room opportunity that, or like summer workshops that uh, Paramount and CBS has. Like the here in Los Angeles, it's the mecca for writers, casting, producers. Like, we have all of these programs. Are they hard to get into? Yes, but they're paid. They're paid gigs, and you are pipelined into our uh, studio system. I can't say, I mean, NBC does have, like, a random New Mexico below-the-line trainee workshop they, they are starting or like a female film forward and like I don't know somewhere not in California but I gotta say if you want to work in casting you would like to either be here in LA or New York when it comes to Broadway because the casting space is very oversaturated and you can be working for a casting agency you could be working for a casting department like there's um, so many routes to go into and from the casting perspective. And just one quick thing I'll add. Um, you know, I start off as a talent agent doing the casting process for that and like submitting our talent to those projects. But then when I was at Warner Brothers and I was working with Tony Sepulveda for the head of television casting, it was different. Now he, we were looking at the reels of that the agents had sent over and working with some bigger talent as well, like 
can Reese Witherspoon do this job or who's a step down from Reese Witherspoon that we can get at a smaller budget and that she's available or something like that. So I saw both sides of the casting process of submitting to Warner Brothers and then now Warner Brothers coming back and saying, this works, this is in our budget, they can make this time. So it's very, it depends on what you're interested in. You know what I mean? Do you wanna like be the one that chooses them or do you wanna be the one that submits them and gets them the job? Any other questions? Yeah, everyone can speak to that, but I think I don't I think it's it could be with every industry you go into. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, I want to be a doctor. Well, you're going to have to be in school for this long and you're going to be in this much debt. Is it really worth it? You should just get a finance job or something. So, you have to be smart. You have to know what it really is. It's probably going to be long hours for not great pay starting out. But if you can plan that and budget that out and just know what you're going into is the biggest thing. We're not trying to kid ourselves and say, oh, we'll be, you know, we're gonna make tons and tons of money right away. It's like, no, it's gonna be a long road and not for a lot of pay sometimes. But as long as you know that, then you can plan accordingly. Don't take the first job that's offered to you. Like, I underestimated my value in my first gig. Like, I know people would be like, take the first job, take the first internship. Don't say yes right away because there could be red flags that you're not seeing. There could be something that's like shady. It could be a scam. Like, don't underestimate what you're worth, honestly. Like, and that could be said for every industry, every job. When I was on PR, the first job I was offered, I was making a, a whopping $31,000 a year, and I thought I was living the dream. When in reality, my uh, ex-boss was paying me like, so below, I was like barely making minimum wage. And because I was a salary person, I, if I worked overtime, oh well, you're still on the clock. If you wanna, when I worked in PR, I was on the clock on Sundays at two o'clock in the morning. If I didn't answer an email, oh well. So when I say don't take the first job that's offered to you, take a step back, look at everything, read everything, look at your offer letter from an internship and to like a job offer because there could be something like shady in between the lines and get a second opinion. I mean, don't get unsolicited advice by like grandma, but just be weary about certain jobs, especially in the industry. Don't take jobs off Indeed. That's basically Craigslist. Um, get a, go to reputable places like LinkedIn or like NBCUniversalCareers.org or, or not or .org or like UTA, like whatever it is go to somebody that is reputable and credible. About the money. Um, about the money. Um, because you're in the arts, it, it really has to be the driving force, in, in my opinion. Uh, the arts are so different. It really, you really do you, you, you have a passion about them, you have a purpose for them, they're exciting to you, and money should really be secondary. Now, I'm also a father with sons <laughs> who are making their way in the world, and, and money is very important, too, to sustain you. It should not, in my opinion, be the driving, uh, the goal of what your job is, is about especially in the arts, especially in the arts. It will, it'll be enough. Um, one thing that is really intriguing though, one of my, or several of my friends, but one of my very best friends, roommate from college, his father, he wanted to be an artist. And his father was a very successful CPA in Virginia Beach, and he just <laughs> simply said, well, I'm not sending you to the University of Richmond to be an artist you're gonna have to take business. So, you know, good guy, he said, all right, okay, I'll be a business major. Well, I lured him out here, uh, along with some other buddies from the University of Richmond, and we all had our dreams when I went into songwriting. Uh, he went into art, the Art Center of Design. 
So he pursued his passion for the arts with a business knowledge, which is really helpful. Um, he, he went on to actually start a hugely successful graphic design studio. He started the Disney Channel uh, magazine when Disney Channel was just opening up. Uh, he's gone on, he went on to be hugely successful in his passion because he also knew business. And often, especially in our business, there's a lot of freelancing that happens these days. You know, I've been at Warner's, I have a very unusual history to have had the, you know, the, t the longevity at a, in my task or my studio for so long. That's the aberration, that truly is. Generally, you're freelancing and you're doing things. To have a good knowledge of business, I would really recommend that everybody in the arts take some business classes while you're in an environment that provides them for you. Um, I think it's very helpful, the combination. Well, along those lines, my uh, esteemed fellow uh, cab panelist said, we, just, we have just gone through a strike and the industry has not come back. I mean, there are still people that haven't worked in over a year. Find a side hustle that's not directly involved in the arts. Find something that you really like doing that you're good at, but figure out a way to make money because then you want to be free to take the jobs, to wait for the good jobs. So figure out a way to make money, whether it's editing at night, you know, copywriting, whatever, selling stuff on eBay. Figure out a way to make money. Um, hopefully, you know, it, it, or find a job. A friend of mine came out and she got a job at a special effects house, but she, with the understanding that if she ever got offered production work, that she would then be free to go take it. You know, if you're interested in it as a DP, get a job at a camera house. Um, but have money, figure out how to make money to support yourself so that you can pick and choose. Um, every job, I can't say that I was paid for every job that I've done, but I would always ask, what am I getting out of it? So there had to be something for me, whether it was the credit, that I needed for IMDb, whether it was the experience, because it was something I didn't know what I was doing, and if it was certainly a credit that I didn't want, experience that I didn't need, well, then they sure as heck better pay me. And depending on the job and how horrible or how great the job is, pay me more or pay me less. So, you know, kind of look into it. Um, and then if you start working with people, at some point say, okay, you got the taste. You know what you're getting, now you need to pay. Because at some point, I also encountered where I had helped some people on weekend projects, and then they had a regular TV show, and they didn't call me, and I'd be like, well, wait a minute. And they're like, oh, but you like to do the, no, I don't like to do those for free. I'm thinking I'm making an inroad with you. And then you realize that none of their buddies are working with them on these free gigs on the weekend because they wanted to get paid. And you know who got the jobs, the paid jobs during the week? the buddies. Um, I have said no to jobs. I have said no and then gotten a call back. I've turned down work and then two weeks later been called in. So what she was saying, don't take the first job. I think it should be more, don't be that eager. Yes. Yeah. The first job might be great, but also um, there's a lot of scams out there and they will always kind of prey on your eagerness and also it's going away, somebody else is gonna take the job and just like any other scam, they want you to make that decision quick. So if it sounds too good, if there's no one that you know that's working at that job, you know, do your research, do your due diligence. And you might have to work for free on occasion. Hopefully you won't, but like I said, I know my length of time that I'll work and for who I'll work and then it might be somebody that you know later on will work for me. So always know what you're getting out of it, what you're putting in. Great, thank you. We do have time for one last question back there. Thank you. 
all the above. Do the internships at the community college level if you can, um, and do the internship class because you can get one academic credit, two, you're go using units to finish your AA to transfer, three, it is, if you're getting your internships at the community college level, you're already more competitive when you transfer to a four year. So yes, put, your, put yourself out there and apply for the big companies, but also be realistic and know that you may or may not hear from them. And also look at smaller and local companies like here in Ventura County or in Northridge and look at like small production companies or a VFX house or uh, looking, if you wanna work in PR, taking a PR internship or a journalism internship at like the Acorn or something. Like I know, I know my people. Um, radio, whatever it is, get the experience now while you have the opportunity because when you uh, transfer to your four year and you already have that one or two internships under your belt, girl, you're gonna be set up for success because you're already gonna come out ahead of your peers who haven't had the opportunity. And so be like, oh, I already did a journalism internship at the local radio station. I already know how to uh, use Final Cut Pro. I already know how to use uh, Pro Tools or whatever it is, you already have that experience and you're already ahead of the game. You already have that internship experience and we look, we want people who have had that experience at the smaller level who can work their way up at the bigger level. So be ambitious, apply for those big internships, but also be realistic and look at all levels. I mean, I'll also let my other colleagues talk about this, but Ironically, many, many, many years ago, I worked uh, during a summer uh, putting together a book of co-op opportunities. So different internship programs. Now, this is many, many, many years ago. But the one thing I, um, I think is still true today, Bridget can correct me, take advantage of being able to be an intern while you're in college. Yes. Because the companies that hire you, then they know that you're being overseen and supervised by somebody at your school versus if you graduate and then try to get an internship, there are some companies won't even take interns who are no longer in school. Sure. I did that. So there you go. And internships really a lot about this industry, I guess I'll tie up what we've all said all along. A lot of it really is your work experience. Book knowledge is great, but really when it comes down to it, it's when you're actually working is when you learn. You might apply some of the stuff, but there also might be stuff that you're learning by the time you get out into the workforce, it's already been outdated or they're doing something different. So work experience really is important and people will look at that in terms of future hiring. Correct. Sorry, just one quick thing. No, sorry, sorry. Um, you know, I was supposed to get an internship in 2020. Um, so this is April and the world had shut down and they're like, you need an internship to graduate. And I was like, that sounds good, but like everything's shut down. What do you want me to do? And the casting agency was the only one that was willing to take me on because they were doing voiceovers, which people could record at their homes. So I was working with those actors, but I didn't, and I hated applying for internships. I felt like I was thrown into a void of 10 trillion applicants and I was never going to get it. And what I will say is internships are great. If you can get them, look at smaller ones where maybe you can have more of a opportunity to shine and say, I did this, this, and this, and this for this company that I maybe wouldn't have had if I went straight, no offense, but like to NBC, you know, it's impossible. And um, lastly, I would say, if you don't do an internship, I would be on LinkedIn all the time. You just need to make connections and network and message and say, hey, I see you work for this company. Can we have a you know 10 minute conversation next week just to talk about what you do and then make your connections like that because they might not post one or haven't post one yet, but they go, you know, in a couple months, we were actually posting a thing for an internship, but I'll just give it to you because I talked to you, it's easier. So use LinkedIn as much as you can and make those network connections because that'll help you also get those little jobs or freelance gigs or internships. 
Uh, um, as far as Warner Brothers, it's ironic you bring this up because I just finished, actually last week, uh, working with two students. Um, one of them is at the Berkeley School of Music uh, back east. Um, and the other one had, had been an intern. And Warner's has great intern programs. Um, they, uh, they close, in, the, in this case, the, the young lady at Berkeley, um, I, I was in touch with her mother. And um, the deadline is March 15th, I believe. So you'll see that the studios, they have a deadline. And however, they are extensive internships. Um, and in, our, in this case, you either have to be in an undergraduate position or I believe working on a master's program, right? So, and I can't tell you how valuable they are, certainly at Warner Brothers. is a massive studio and you're exposed to so many opportunities. And I could name you right now, I'm thinking of fr a friend who has a fantastic graphic design studio now. And she started as an intern at Warner Brothers. I can tell you about a, an editor who went to Cal State Northridge, which is a great film school. He learned so much, came in, worked as an intern in the post-production department. He was so good. Everything we've been talking about, his attitude, his eagerness, his perception of what he needed to do. Um, they called him back when a job came up, and within three years, he was a full-time union editor doing online <laughs> you know, work within like three years. So these are fabulous, fabulous paths. And, and secondly, what you said, just work someplace. Uh, it doesn't have to be the big places. It's great if you can get in, and, and they, the studios have great programs, but definitely get into a company that's actually doing what you want to do. Very important. All right, thank you so much for answering the questions. We're going to conclude on that note because we do have some food ready for all of you guys outside. Uh, I believe we have some tables set up. Um, but before we let you guys go, please give a nice round of applause to our panelists. Thank you guys so much for your time. We really appreciate you guys being here.